So Warren Smith, it is so good to uh, be able to uh, spend some time with you again. Well, thank you, thank you. And uh, oh, now pleasure. we're up at your uh, studio here on the, just off the Grand Concourse. Mm -hmm. And I want you to uh, talk about this instrument or these series of instruments that are sitting in front of you here. Well, as you can see, my, and my, always my favorite instrument is the kettle drums. The yeah. And um, this set of mallets I've collected over a period of years. My first wife is deceased now, but she made this bag and put my initials on it for me to carry all my various uh, timbre mallets. Now, you can hit any one of these drums with one of these mallets, and it would sound different.
um, record that I heard on that Coleman do, and it was like, it was so strange. I said, Dang, I don't know if I like that or not. So I heard it on the radio the following week, and I listened to it again. I said, hmm. So the third time I heard it, it tracked me, so I just went down and bought the record. Yeah. And then I got to know more of that. You know, even had the chance to sit in with him at his studio and play a few times. Now, did you play this tune when you played it? He played it. I, I was just accompanying it. Yeah, him, yeah, know? yeah. But, but it's up here, you know. Uh -huh. So I don't know if he ever heard me try to play that on the timpani, you know. Yeah. yeah. So now, uh, what made you choose this particular series of instruments? Uh, when I was in high school, they had a couple of timpani in the back that nobody played with us. We were all playing the snare drum or the bass drum, or, you know. And um, I kept messing with it because I was intrigued by it in high school. So when I got to college, I was able to major on percussion and the timpani became my major instrument. So I did my graduate recital, my senior recital, my graduate recital, and the other recitals just on the timpani. You know, because they have a lot of um, classical music, so I absorbed all that knowledge. But not too many people have tried to play our own classical music, so-called jazz. Yeah. You know, so I started doing that, and uh, a whole bunch of other people got into that. You know, and um, I had all these drums. I had a studio over on 51st Street. Uh, I, I'm sorry. 151 West 21st Street. Yeah. For about 30 years. And I had a set of timpani. I didn't have all six of these. I had maybe three or four. And uh, a lot of people were coming up to rehearse, you know, because I had all these percussion instruments. Max Roach comes up to rehearse with his group. Yeah, yeah. And he sees the timpani and he sees the. So I said, we should have a percussion ensemble. So he started doing boom in that studio. Incredible. You know, and, and there were six of us originally, Joe Chambers, Freddie Waits, Omar Clay, Roy Brooks. Roy Brooks, thank you. Uh, and me Fred and Max. King, Fred King. And Fred King, that's right, because because Fred King was a timpani player that I knew, and I didn't want to be stuck playing timpani all the time, so we brought him in so I could play some of the other instruments. You know, a, a story, no matter who I talk to, particularly if they're uh, percussionists, uh, somewhere in the conversation, someone has to mention, oh, we had to go up to Warren's place. So we went to <laughs> Warren's It's like Warren's place comes up in every conversation when you talk to percussionists. Yeah. And, and, and why do you think that's so? That's part of the reason right there. Because I, I was just rehearsing, you know, and what would happen was, you know, a couple of people like Max would come in and pretty soon, the tenants from the other buildings would come across the roof and down on the fire escape and listen to the rehearsal. Yeah. So Anton yeah. said, we ought to do some concerts in here since we attracted people. And that's what started the whole thing. There's a place where you hit a timpani. And there's a place where you do not hit the timpani. Now, the center of a large head is what they call the note, because all the vibrations travel towards the center. So that note is going to be a dead spot. area here, away from the rim, you get not this, but you get and each one of those drums, you don't get that note ever, you just, because even there you're going to get an indefinite pitch, you see. So not only do you have to hit the drum in that area, but there's also a way that you don't just hit the drum, you hit it in such a way that you're trying to pull the sound out. Mm -hmm. you know? There's, um, I forget who did this song called The Drum is a Woman. Oh, the drum is a woman. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the thing is, you, what I teach my students was, you don't smack a woman, in the, you know. Mm -hmm. You, you mm -hmm. touch and try to pull some energy and some sound out of it. And, and you do that and it's an entirely
can see some drum sets, particularly the snare drum, where the whole center of the drum is kind of sucking in. Mm -hmm. Because the guys just brutalize it, they yeah. don't know that, that there's a touch that you apply. Right, it's, a, it's the place of repetitive stress. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and people that don't know, you see that. <laughs> yeah. You can look at their instrument and say, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it, it's all, you know, but I had teachers from early on that were teaching me about touch and sensitivity and, and, and things like that, so that you incorporate that into your whole uh, musical perspective. You know, I want you to go back and, uh, and, 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 and again tell me some stories about your dad and uh, what he did for a living. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, well, my father, um, the earliest stories he told me, he, you know, they, he was born in North Carolina. We still have a homestead down in the country in North Carolina, right? Right in the middle of the Golden Triangle. Uh, once in Salem and Greensboro and Charlotte, and our place is right there, like in the center of that. But he grew up there and he had a family moved to Chicago, mm -hmm. right? Oh, my uncle Lloyd was the music publisher. So my father had a chance to go to Europe uh, as a young man, you know, maybe before he was 20. So he went by Uncle Lloyd's place and got a whole package of new music publications. Now this, you know, music was being printed out, but it, you know, they didn't have these mass things. So when he went to France, they, they, they stopped at Calais, mm -hmm. and that's where all the Americans went first before they went to Paris. And what happened was all the black people that were in Paris at that time from the States would come down to Calais and see who was coming in off the ship. So Pop comes off and he's got this whole package of brand new compositions and arrangements. And they just grabbed him, you know. So he stayed over there for more than five years. And um, you know, the, you know, the arrangements got spread around. All the people, Louis Armstrong was, was, was over in Europe at that time. Yeah, so they were good friends and whatnot. I remember when I was six years old meeting Louis Armstrong at, at the, the Chicago Musicians Union. You know? Yeah, and, yeah. And so he went over there and stayed for five years and did very well before he came back and, and married my mother and started a family. You know, but. Um, the music was so important to the people there because they had been cut off from the African American tradition. Right. Now, right. every time somebody came from the United States, they would bring some packages of that tradition. So all these black people that were living in Europe at that time would come down and see who was there and absorb all this stuff, you know, and spread it around. Yeah. So that's yeah. how a lot of that music uh, was so popular in, in Europe in general. Now your dad had a, uh, a a music shop in Chicago. Yes, and uh, and talk about uh, what took place in that shop. Well, it was a shop where he could strip down a saxophone, any kind. Of, we had every saxophone from the soprano to the bass. Mm -hmm. You know, because because he was working on. I remember one day Charlie Parker comes in. My alto was messed up. Pops took the horn apart, put new pads on it. You know, and. You know, and it was burned again, you know. Yeah. But, yeah. but, you know, all these famous people, Gene Ammons and Johnny Griffin, came by our house and took music lessons from my dad. Yeah. You know, all these famous Chicago saxophone players always came to our house to get their horns fixed. You know, so that was an education in itself. I can imagine. Yeah. So you, uh, you, you gained this, uh, this musical education at home. Mm -hmm. But um, when did you? When was your very first paid gig? I was 14 years old, and um, did you ever hear of a baritone sax player named Pat Patrick? No. Well, Pat Patrick and I were the same age. We were, now Pat Patrick's son is now the governor of Massachusetts, Deval Patrick. Deval Patrick. Yeah, wow, that, that, that's his son. Yeah. yeah. But he and I were the same age, and we did our first gig together playing 
And do you know what the Elks Club is? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they, they had the Black Elks Club, and they had a band that my dad played in, like Friday and Saturday nights. Yeah. So my first gig was subbing for the drummer on that band. You know, playing the drum. I didn't know shit about playing the drum. Well, I did. I knew how to play the snare drum. You know? Yeah. But now, I, was now, now I have to ask you because, you know, during those days, when uh, musicians gather and they would come to the Elves Club, more often than not, it was for a dance. Yes. And uh, it, 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 am I correct to say that on those particular occasions, uh, those venues uh, included dancing? Absolutely. And, and talk about that experience. Well, it, it, man, it was really something because, I mean, it's something that I miss these days. I, well, you don't go to dances anymore, but you could sit in the band and watch this crowd of people out on the floor, you know, and they start dancing and everybody's head would be in a rhythm, you know, bam, 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 yeah. bam, and you'd see all these heads bouncing around at the same time, wherever you look, there's heads over there, you know, and the women were doing this, you know, and some of them got kind of athletic with the jitterbug and all that stuff, Yeah. but in general, when they played that slow dance music, everybody's head was right in time with the bass drum. And, and bass, yeah. Yeah. And so uh, included in the band as you uh, go from gig to gig, more often than not, you would hire dancers as well and to be part of the performance. That, that was completely social, except mm -hmm. for the fact that when uh, dancing was so popular that the people that were really good dancers started putting on exhibitions. Right. You know? Now, sometimes they would hire their own band. You know, or, or you go to a, a, a gig specifically just to play for that dancing group or, or exactly. a particular kind of, okay, we're going to play jitterbug, so they play, you know, if they want to play waltz, we play waltz, you know, yeah. whatever it was, there was a song and a rhythm that fitted that. Yeah. So you had to know that. So you were part of, uh, of those group of people that would, could be hired to uh, play for the different uh, venues. Yeah. Back then. Mm -hmm. Now, when did you decide that you were going to become an edu educator as well as a uh, a working musician? Oh man, I guess I I must have been in college before yeah. before that became a possibility because I had studied drums from a teacher from the time I was six years old all through high school and all through college. Right, right. And then I realized that it's, it's time to pass that information on to the next generation. Yeah. So, you know, uh, and, and having a master's degree was, um, in those days, the only way you could get into education on the college level as a teacher. Right. And especially if it was black. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. So I decided to get that master's degree and while I was playing music, I was able to support myself by teaching school. First right. I substituted, and then as a regular, I went and got to the college level. So now when you uh, finally uh, got settled in New York and decided to become an educator, uh, talk about that experience, like uh, going into the schools. I think you first started in the New York City school system. And, and, and talk about that experience a little bit. It was a matter of survival. Yeah. All right? Now, yeah. I, I, I had a, um, I had all of the um, credentials to be a professional percussionist, a right. symphonic percussionist. So, you know, I did all study symphonic music. And the jazz music studies were on my, on my side because it was never my intention to get lost in the symphony orchestra. Although I like symphony music, I don't want to be around that music constantly or those people constantly. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, yeah. And, um, so um, the thing was that I knew it was going to be music, first of all, all right? Now, I see my family scuffle, the musicians in my family, I mean, all of them were, but most of them wound up working in the post office. Yeah, right? now, yeah. You know, as, so, my option was the post office or school teaching. Yeah. So I chose school teaching rather than the post office. And the school teaching that turned out was more money, or, or would eventually wind up being more money. 
And I got a better picture than I would have gotten in the post office. Right. So right. that was the main thing. But the main thing was that in order to be a musician, the easiest side job for me to have was not in the post office, but teaching music. Right. So I got uh, you know the, the uh, master's degree, which enabled me to teach high school. That that was such a ridiculous uh, thing. You know, you, you couldn't be in the late fifties going into the sixties. You couldn't be an artistic specialist. Right. You know, I, I remember when I went to get my license, they were jacking up a woman who was from France. Mm -hmm. She had this beautiful French accent. They didn't want her to teach French in the junior high schools and sky schools in New York because she had a French accent. <laughs> they thought that their accent should be more Americanized, all right? But I always thought this was silly, but that was the kind of attitudes that they were having. They, they didn't want to hear nothing about jazz music. Yeah, you yeah. Know? So all of that had to be like on the slack. Yeah. You know? But what was it the thing about jazz music uh, in terms of uh, how it was how it was treated in academia? It, what was it, it? It, it was it was see this was before um, African American studies had started. Right. And what nothing, year are we talking about? Uh, 1958. Yeah. Six. Well, yeah. 57 I came here, so between 57, 58 was when I started teaching. Right. And, um, you know, fortunately I had the classical education which qualified me for all this stuff. But we had to sneak and teach things and, you know, I'll give an example. Uh, I go to a high school on First Avenue 124th Street, all black school. And, They've got these kids in this what they call general music class. So I walk in there and um, they're talking about, oh, the darkest night home, oh, black Joe, I see those gentle darkies. You know, that, and I mean, they're giving you the handbook for music education in this black department with all these Stephen Collins Foster bullshit songs. Yeah, yeah. So, Naturally, the kids are unruly. So I saw this the first day, and I'm looking at the book. So the next day, I walk in, and, and the class is unruly because they're used to this shit. So all of a sudden, I just go to the piano, and I and I had learned this to do this, and I'm sorry. Boom, 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 shake, boom, don't, 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 shake, boom, don't, 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 shake, boom. You know, and I finished the first part, and I looked at the kids, and the whole damn class. <laughs> has come, and we played the book. Man, before we finish the song, the principal, the assistant principal, and all the officials were standing in the back. What did he do to get those kids to be quiet? Yeah. All I did was bring them some of their music. Exactly. Which was unknown in those days. We didn't have African American studies. Yeah. You yeah. know, and, and they're teaching us about cotton picking and shit. You know what I mean? Or, yeah. You know, that's, that's, you know, and I knew that was a little fly. Yeah. So yeah. when they saw the success of that, they made lift me to fuck them up. Right. You know, but before that, you know, man, you had to learn all this old segregated bullshit. And I'm happy to say that I was one of the people that started making that separation. Now, if you go down to the SBCUs, HBCUs, they were teaching jazz. Exactly. You know, yeah. and we couldn't do that here. Yeah. You know, we had to sleep, you know. Yeah. I guess that's why they call this up south. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and the farther you get in, in, in upstate New York, it's really up south. Yeah. So now you're, you're teaching, uh, you're, you're basically bringing the music lesson to where the students live. You, exactly. You, you, you exactly. meet them. You meet them where they are musically, mm -hmm. and how did that make a difference in the in the music experience of uh, some of your students? It was the beginning of a change because they could see the the, the difference one black teacher made showing an interest in the black students' culture was going to change things, yeah. Yeah. and it wasn't happening yet. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, we went to uh, Amherst, Massachusetts mm -hmm. for a conference, 
and Max was teaching up there, teaching one class. Yeah, yeah, there I remember. There was no African American music studies. Yeah. You know, and we got together and started talking about all the ways that this could be enhanced and evolved. And the next year they started their programs. Yeah. You know, but it wasn't in the school at all. You know, I, I mean, I, I can say that I was one of the people on the front line of putting those courses into junior high schools and high schools in, in the United States. Right, right. Up, up, up south, I mean to say. Exactly. Because exactly. they were doing it down south. Exactly. You know? Now, talk about your experiences at, uh, at SUNY Old Westbury. Oh, man. That was the greatest time of my life. Mm -hmm. I, I was teaching um, in the junior high schools in the city. And I had a friend named Ken McIntyre, who was from Boston. But he and I, I was working in his band. He was working in my band sometimes. And, and we were just good friends. And um, he went to Wesleyan University in Connecticut yeah. and started teaching. So. The second year he taught there, um, the, one of the teachers was hired to start a new music program at Old Westbury. So he came to Ken McIntyre because he knew that there should be some black influence in it. And said, okay, I got this school, would you like to start uh, an African American music program in the school? Mm -hmm. He's a black guy, you know. He wound up going to someplace, something Washington State after he left Old Westbury. Yeah. But he left Ken in charge and Ken brought me with him. So he gave me the music history, which gave me an avenue to bring black jazz people into the program to as guest artists. You know, Alice Coltrane came and, and a few other people, Ben Riley and, and um Richard. Reggie Work. Reggie Work. Yeah. yeah. They all came and, and guessed it for me, you know. And in fact, she paid them and wouldn't accept any money from me for doing the class. Yeah. Because she could see where this was going, you know. So, yeah. Um, but man, she was, she was just so smooth and knowledgeable and, 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 and you know, you, you could call a tune from out of the blue. Alice got it. Wow. And you she know, played that. piano. Yeah, Back yeah, yeah, she was a pianist. Yeah, so. and what was her playing like? Uh, it's personal. It's yeah, jazz, you know, mm -hmm. but but I mean, it was her own style. Yeah, you know, you know um, um, it was modern. It was sometimes in harmonic when she wanted to, but in this case, she stayed inside because she was playing for college kids. Yeah, so yeah. she wasn't trying to like impress anybody. She was trying to give them some knowledge of our culture. Right, right. You know, so she would throw it back. And, and that's what I always had to do. You know, we, we, we didn't expose that outside thing to the kids in the class. They had to come and see us outside of school. Right, to, to right. To see us doing that, you know. So what's the difference uh, between uh, that freestyle uh, that you would play, like for instance, you had mentioned if you were playing it outside, What's the, what's the difference in that expression as opposed to the way that you would teach it? Give me an example of uh, your mindset uh, as it relates to both. Well, to me, the, the, the teaching aspect of it is, is exposing people to the rudiments. Yes. All right? Now, the larger purpose is to unlock their minds so that they will allow their imaginations to guide them someplace that maybe I wouldn't think of. Or yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. You, you want to take the teaching out of it and open up their own mind to self-teach or, or to utilize their inner knowledge and culture. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, so what you do is, I mean, you expose them to all kinds of stuff, you know, you know, but then allow them to take a choice. So Juan, you had mentioned earlier that uh, Alice Coltrane had come uh, into your class. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want you to talk about her and her playing as a musician. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about that, your impression of her playing. Well, first of all, um, 
she had the whole spectrum of what they call jazz piano. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, historically from, you know, the, the what do they call it, the, the ragtime and all that stuff. She had the knowledge of that. But being in the environment that she was in, you know, being able to hear Coltrane's explorations every day and every night, and then he get to the saxophone and practice all day until it was time to go to work. But he was just so completely obsessed with that development that, that he was still growing up when he died. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? I mean, in terms of development, there, there, was, there was a lot more that you could see was going to be coming right. later and, on, but, but he didn't get there. Yeah. Now, did you see uh, some of that uh, progression? Did you see that in her playing as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Talk yeah. about that a little. Yeah, yeah. Because she, well, she, she could do the spectrum of, she walk into a class of kids and she could play down to the level that they would understand. Yeah. And then take it out. You know, cause, cause she was just that. She was from a musical family. Like, yeah. Like, like I told you, I knew her. Her brother and I were playing together. I didn't realize that they were related because I knew her as Alice Coltrane until I. Yeah, got to know her a little better. Yeah, yeah. she used to be Alice McLeod from Detroit. Yeah, 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 right, exactly. You know, yeah. I knew some people from Detroit. You know, in fact, my oldest daughter lives in Detroit now. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and her husband was a musician. You yeah, know, both doctors, but but of course, you know, and as a matter of fact, Don Bird was a friend of mine, and he was from Detroit. And yeah, a couple of other people, Roy Brooks was from Roy Detroit. Roy Brooks, exactly. You know, so exactly. when I go there, I you know be able to bounce around a whole bunch of other folks. But yeah, yeah, Ron Carter. Yeah, Ron we, Carter, yeah. Well, Ron Carter and I were in school together, man, yeah. school music. Yeah. Did you know Marcus Belgrave at all? Yeah. What what some of your uh, best memories of, of I, I, I I never had a chance to play with Marcus, but but you know, anytime you went near Detroit you heard about Marcus. Yeah. You know, because yeah. I mean he was like he was Winton before Winton. You know, I, I, I'm glad you made that comparison because uh, in, in a lot of ways that's how I think of you in, in that way too because you're not just a phenomenal musician, you're a wonderful mentor and educator and, uh, and you fit into that same mold. Uh, as a uh, Marcus Belgrave and mm -hmm. so many Art Blakey, Betty Carter, so many of the great musicians who are also wonderful mentors and educators. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the reason why I ask you about uh, Alice Coltrane, because you know I'm a volunteer at the uh, Alice and John Coltrane home out in Dixon, Long Island. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, hearing these Alice Coltrane stories is it's very, very important. There's not too many of us left that uh, you know that can tell those stories. And and uh, and if I just had a, just a few minutes of your time uh, to talk about John and Alice Coltrane and uh, and your impressions of them as a as a, a, a musical powerhouse. Oh man, very, very, very important. Very, very important. You know. I, I'm, Coltrane, I, I knew I didn't play with him as a drummer. I played with him as a percussionist yeah. in some large ensembles. Right. Now, what instrument did you play when you played with John Coltrane? Oh, timpani. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, okay. it was like big orchestras. So yeah. So they yeah. had timpani, but but you know he had who was working with him then? Was it Philly? It wasn't Philly. It was. Um, it was Elvin Jones. That's who it was. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's how Elvin and I got to be good friends because I was such, you know. I, I remember once I went to a place, it was called the Old Five Spot. Mm -hmm. Before the new Five Spot, you moved over to the East Side. Right, right. You know. Now, uh, going back to, to Alice, yeah. uh, after uh, John Coltrane's transition, uh, did you have any experience playing with her? When, for instance, when she moved to California and uh, and started a whole new other musical mu uh, yeah. movement, did you uh, were you involved in any of that? No, uh, I was not. I, yeah. I, I kind of lost contact with her when she moved away from New York. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. but she was graceful enough to come in and play that concert 
right. for my class and me and refuse, you know, I know she paid the musicians. But now who did she bring with her? She brought Reggie Workman and Ben Wright. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, now, you know, I mean, there, there was no sex player. It was just, it was just them. You know? Yeah. They didn't yeah. need it. <laughs> absolutely, you know? absolutely. They were fantastic. Yeah. So now you, uh, so what are you doing now? Um, I'm working on these six kettle drums. Right. As, as, a, as a melodic sequence. I'm experimenting with all the percussion stuff. Uh, yeah. I, I, I plan to do some solo percussion stuff, but I also plan to do some stuff where I can overdub two or three, like playing the kettle drum, and then playing the vibraphone, and then playing the marimba, and then playing the drum set. Right. So I'm going to do that downstairs. Right, right. Um, so where is music going now? Well, uh, there are some places it's going that I like, which is acoustically. Yeah. What, what I worry about is that music will get mechanized by machinery and electronics to the extent where it will destroy some of the humanity and emotional effects that we hear yeah. from the other musicians. Yeah. Yeah. You know, these, these guys are very interested in technology, but I don't think they realize that the technology to me, is usurping their own ingenuity. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think they're relying too much on pushing buttons to get effects than trying to bring that out of themselves. Yeah, yeah. I noticed that the, the little experimentation you did by spinning the top on the top of the skin. Oh, and you said, oh man, I got to Maybe I, I can find some sound coming from that. And I love that about you because you're still in the experimental stage. Oh, oh I, you know, it's like you're always a student, and uh, and and I find that so incredibly amazing about you. Um, so now tell me some about your projects and some of the things you're archive, you archiving mm -hmm. some stuff now, and I want you to talk a little bit about that. Well, I, I've got you know like over fifty years of experience, and I've got a bunch of cassette tapes which are no longer. Well, they've got to be digitized. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're records of, of, of past works that we've done. I did years of work with Ken McIntyre. Yes, yes. You mentioned that. At, at, and at the State University of Illinois. Every time he dedicated, Lord. he gave me a tape. And I've got a whole section of walls of just live musical performance yeah. from him and other people. And um, the University of Indiana has talked to me about taking my archive. Right, All right, right. Now, they will digitize that stuff and I will have uh, access to it. Yeah, yeah. But they will also get it out of my house and get it someplace where it can be more accessible to... Exactly. Because you, know, you don't want them, you don't want the tapes to deteriorate, so... That, see, that's another thing. Yeah, you, know? you want to and, make and, sure and, you get And I don't want, you know, go out and get hit by a car and then say, Oh, what's all this shit? Let's just throw it in the garden. Oh, that's what will happen, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's what somebody happen. somebody like me to come along and say, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I just feel so fortunate to be here with you and you telling all these great stories and you're demonstrating a lot of that stuff on drums. And I just want to say uh, thanks so much, Warren, for inviting me to your studio so I can capture some of this because I think this is important to our society, it's important to our culture, it's important to our art. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I just want to say, uh, before we continue, I just want to say uh, thank you so very much, Professor Warren, for uh, uh, allowing me into your space.